We begin with the history of the Metro East Air Base, marking 100 years of service to the U.S. Now, you may recall back in 2005, the Pentagon was shutting down military bases. But Illinois and the Bi-State region breathed a sigh of relief when it was revealed Scott Air Force Base was not on the list of closures, and it remains open today. Jim Kircher shows us Scott's journey to the century mark. Scott Air Force Base is 100 years old this year and marked its centennial in June with an open house and air show. If you're looking for a role St. Louis plays in the country and the world, you can't do much better than Scott Air Force Base. It's a major player in global military operations and an economic driver of the region and southwestern Illinois. It's had a number of roles and seen quite a collection of flying machines and airships in a history that stretches back to the First World War. In 1917, local business and civic leaders convinced the War Department to select a one-square-mile tract of land just northeast of Belleville, near the farming community of Mascuta, for an airfield. A well-known local aviation enthusiast, Major Albert Bond Lambert, one of the developers of Lambert St. Louis International Airport, was instrumental in helping to locate the field here. The aviation station was named in honor of Corporal Frank S. Scott, Five years earlier, in 1912, Scott had crashed at a flying field in Maryland and became the first enlisted man to die in a military flying accident. Today, Scott Air Force Base is still the only Air Force installation named for an enlisted man. With the United States drawn into World War I, building plans for the field were accelerated. 3,000 workers completed its construction, including about 60 buildings, in only two months. Pilot and ground crew training began as soon as the field was completed, and the first flight took place in September 1917. Student pilots frequently crash-landed in remote places and were sometimes injured. Many airfields would modify another airplane to carry the injured pilots to hospitals. Scott's Air Ambulance, a modified Jenny biplane, transported its first patient, an aviator who had broken his leg in the summer of 1918. In modern times, Scott Air Force Base would have command over military and humanitarian airlifts around the world. But in those first days, the Air Corps was new and small, still defining its role and trying to prove its usefulness in war and peace. After training 500 pilots and hundreds more ground crew during World War I, the War Department announced in 1919 that Scott Field would be kept as a permanent installation. This would mark the beginnings of a successful military and civilian relationship. 1917, they leased, and it wasn't just the Air Corps then, but uh, that was the primary use. The Army leased 600 and something acres out there. And then in 1919, they bought it. Uh, they paid uh, $119,000 for what's now Scott Air Force Base, about the price of a uh, nice three-bedroom home today. In 1921, Scott was designated a lighter-than-air station and would become home base to a squadron of airships. This new mission required the construction of new facilities, including a huge airship hangar that was so large it was visible from 25 miles away. Reportedly 100,000 men, almost the entire United States Army of 1923, could have stood inside. Airships, or dirigibles, were designed as rigid, semi-rigid, or non-rigid. Scott received the Air Service's newest non-rigid dirigible in 1923. At the time, this TC-1 was the largest airship in the service. Three years later, the world's largest semi-rigid airship, the RS-1, was stationed at Scott. Lighter-than-aircraft eventually proved to be unreliable, even dangerous, and the field's lighter-than-air mission came to an end in 1937. The Army Air Corps leaders had decided their future was in heavier-than-air machines airplanes. <laughs> 
Well, everybody loved to see them flying, and of course they were worried about the people that piloted them because those things are so vulnerable to weather. Almost all the lighter-than-air and World War I structures were torn down over the next few years. The giant airship hangar was completely torn down by 1939. Many of its concrete tiles were used as sidewalks in Belleville. In the late 1930s, Scott Field was considered for the Air Force General Headquarters. Because its central Midwest location was less vulnerable to attack, Air Corps leaders planned to manage all future air combat activities from Scott. A major construction program of some $7.5 million was begun, tripling the size of the field to nearly 1,900 acres. World War II disrupted the plans to relocate Air Force headquarters at Scott. Instead, the field would become a major training installation for the next 20 years. But many of the brick buildings built at this time are still in use today. This building was to become Air Force General Headquarters. Today, it houses the 375th Airlift Wing. During World War II, Scott trained radio operators and mechanics. After graduating, they would serve aboard fighters, bombers, and transport aircraft in every theater of operations. Scott Field became known as the Communications University of the Army Air Forces, and Scott Airmen were called the eyes and ears of the Air Corps. Nearly 80,000 troops were trained during World War II. Almost anyone who had anything to do with air communications during the war spent some time at Scott. Communications training continued to be the base's primary mission after the war. In 1947, the Army Air Corps became the United States Air Force, and Scott Field officially became known as Scott Air Force Base in 1948. That same year, the Air Force was instrumental to the success of the Berlin Airlift. U.S. military airlift operations had proven their effectiveness during World War II, but now they were put to a completely different kind of test. In mid-1948, the Soviet Union blockaded the supply routes to Berlin in an attempt to force the Western powers out of the city. To break the blockade, the United States and Great Britain began Operation Vittles, Flying around the clock for 65 weeks, they created a continuous air bridge into the city and delivered a total of 2.3 million tons of food, water, medicine, and supplies to the 2 million people in West Berlin. The Russians eventually lifted the blockade. The Berlin airlift would become the model for airlift operations in the coming years, and Scott would play an increasingly more important role in these missions. In the 1990s, Scott Air Force Base just barely missed being shut down, but now it survives into the 21st century to continue its role or to find a new one. So we're the host to over 30 mission partners and one of the um one of the important mission partners is the United States Transportation Command, and they provide all the transportation capabilities for the Department of Defense. So air, land, and sea, and it's all managed and coordinated and planned and programmed here at Scott Air Force Base. And any time anything happens on the news, whether it's a contingency operation overseas in the Middle East or a humanitarian operation, let's say in Haiti, um, it all starts here at Scott because nothing moves unless the men and women here are doing their jobs. 